Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome. Hamza in the house. Um, sorry about looking around. There's I've got like three different um, recording devices for three different platforms. So what I wanted to do was I just wanted to quickly give a note about Ramadan. Okay. So for those of you who are already celebrating Ramadan, Ramadan Mubarak, those of us who are waiting until tomorrow, inshallah, we will have a very productive Ramadan this year, even considering the circumstances. It's not going to be great, but that doesn't mean we have to completely give up on everything. So what I wanted to talk about today, which won't take much time, um, I wanted to touch on this topic because I think each Ramadan, we should be setting goals for ourselves. We should be looking at what, how we want to improve um, in Ramadan, right? It, you can't just say, well, the message is closed. The, you know, we can't go out. We can't pray taught away, and we can't do this. So I'm just going to sit home and watch NBC too. No, that's obviously not the, the way. So we need to find something how we're going to grow. Well, what are we, how are we going to be productive this Ramadan? Um, and I'll tell you what I'm going to do, right? I'll go first. This Ramadan, my goal is to limit the arguments or debates that I engage in. Uh, I did a program, it wasn't for me, it was for someone else, and I made the mistake of going into the comments. Stupid, I know. But I did it because I genuinely wanted to help people, right? I was giving advice on something, so people were asking questions, and I thought, hey, let me just jump in there and answer these questions. Uh, it didn't take long, right, before I regretted that decision entirely. And the reason is, is that when you produce some kind of media, the people who agree with you typically won't say anything. They won't say anything because they agree. They'll just move on. They'll say, man, that was a great video. And then they'll just continue to the next video. It's the people who disagree with you who are always going to spend the time in the comment section, right? And as human beings, what we like to do, especially when we're mischaracterized or misrepresented, is we want to basically clear our name. We want to clear things up and um, set the record straight. But that's not possible, and I'll tell you why. Just Islamically speaking, you can apply this really to anything, but Islamically speaking, you have two ends of a, a spectrum, okay? You have those who only follow Islam when it comes to the spiritual aspect, right? So they don't care about the rules and the rituals and, you know, what this book and what says and what that book says and the, even the authenticity of that book. And then at the other extreme, at the complete polar opposite, you have those who neglect the entire spiritual aspect, and it's so regimented. It's rules by rules by rules. And they love to impose those rules. And they think that those rules are set in stone, and they can never be moved. So those, of course, you may have guessed, are the ones who are more likely to be in your comment section. Right, The ones who are worried about spirituality aren't going to bother commenting. They're too busy working on their spirituality. It's those hardliners, those extremists, who are always going to be the ones that are going to come in and criticize you for something. So what I did was I put together a, a short list of red flags. Because the thing is, discussion is actually it's a good thing. It's a really good thing to have a healthy discussion, a healthy debate between two individuals to help you grow. But there are certain rules, there are certain things that you need to recognize in the person you're having a conversation with on whether or not it's a productive conversation. Before you waste hours of your life, which they're more than happy to waste, by, by the way, these are the things you should look for. Number one, not asking for clarification. Okay. They never ask you to clarify your position. Why don't they ask you? Because they don't care. They're not interested in your opinion. 
You, my brother, are misguided. You are off the menhaj. You maybe even stepped out of the folds of Islam. But they, on the other hand, they have the truth. So what do they need to hear from you? They're not there to hear your opinions, right? And that's, that's one of the first ways you know, is because they throw accusations out and they never actually ask you to clarify. So if you put something and I disagreed with it, the first thing I would do is make sure that I understood actually what your position is. Because it may be that we're, we actually agree. I just didn't, maybe, you know, we sometimes don't explain things fully or explain them the way that we wanted to or we misspeak. It happens. So it's possible that I hear something you say and I go, I don't agree with that at all. But you know what? Let me make sure I have this right. So I'll ask you, what did you mean by this when you said this? And what did you mean by this? That's the first part of the conversation is clarification. And then you can narrow things down. If you disagree, then you can disagree in a very nice way. Um, which brings us to matters of disagreement, right? If you have never seen two students of knowledge debating, I highly suggest you do. It's, it's really, it's an amazing experience and it shows you, it's a great representation of what debate is supposed to be about. Um, they're very respectful of one another. In fact, you will see them where they'll have very different ideas, very different beliefs, but they will phrase it in a way that it protects the honor of the person they're disagreeing with. So as to not embarrass them or show them shame, because that's not their goal. Their goal is to find the truth and to use the evidences to lead them to the truth. So the manners, right? I have friends who I can literally talk about subjects for five or six hours. We can just sit there and go back and forth and back and forth because of the way that the discussion, the, the, the form that the discussion takes. There are others, on the other hand, I can't last two minutes with them. They're argumentative, okay? You know the type of people where you look up at the sky and you say, brother, the sky is blue. And they'll say, uh, hey, you know, there's, there's, a little, there's a little green over here, and you know, there's, there's some clouds, so we could say white over here, and a little darkness on the... What are you talking about, man? It's like you're looking for an argument. That's what you want. It's this argumentative nature. They just want to argue. So don't feed into this, right? Um, exaggeration or jumping to conclusions. We call it, there's a saying, making a, a mountain out of a molehill, right? You take a very small issue and you make it something ginormous, right? And it doesn't make any sense. So that kind of exaggeration already tells you where they're going with it because they had to make your comment fit their argument. Right? Their argument's not really about your comment because if they would have understood your comment, there would be nothing to say. But they needed to direct your comment towards them so that they could actually have something to say. Oversimplification. Right? If in your debate you hear statements that are oversimplifications, it means you take a very big, complex issue and you make it very simple. Um, the government should give us all sadaqa. What? That is an oversimplification. There's so many complexities. Where does the money come from? Who deserves it? How is it going to get distributed? Who? What? These are oversimplifications. And you'll find this with groups who are very narrow-minded. Everything is very simple and clear-cut to them. So oversimplification is one of those red flags. The term the scholars say, be very careful. Because this is, this is one of, um, when it comes to logical fallacies, right, in arguments, this is one of them. It's called appealing to a higher power, right, or uh, appealing to authority. So if they have an argument, to say, well, you know, the scholars say that this. So my first question is, all of them, they all say that? Or just the ones you listen to, right? It's just like saying, yeah, well, most people say that, you know, this is such and such. Okay, who are most people? Who are some people? Who are 
the scholars that are saying this, right? Um, and typically they don't know, right? Because that's the limit of it. It's all just it's all just to bolster their argument, uh, prolonging the argument. So you almost come to an agreement on an issue, and then they bring up another issue because they have to keep this argument going, right? It's all to get you involved, take up your time. So once you prove a point, they'll move on to the next one. Stop all your head, just bow out, all right? It's not worth it. It's not worth the time or effort. Um, this is a big one right here. Attacks on your intellect or your personality, like personal attacks. So if they say, you know, well, you know, you, you got, a, you know, a Christmas tree beard and blah, 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 blah. You know, as soon as they attack your appearance or the way you look, they're, they're not interested in the argument anymore, right? They, they, they know they've lost, so they're moving on to something that's arbitrary and doesn't really matter. Or they attack your intellect. So this comes up quite often where they'll say, you don't have the knowledge, or that's because you're not knowledgeable. How do they know what knowledge you have? Do they know you? Do they know if you've sent you? What if you had a doctorate degree from Medina University? Are, are you not knowledgeable? But how would they know that? Right? It's a way of saying that you don't have knowledge because you don't agree with me. If you were knowledgeable in Islam, then you would come to the same conclusions I've come to. Or as the scholars have said, you know, that my opinion is correct. So as soon as they go there, again, it's not worth your time or effort. Um, fake piety, where they say, you know, uh, you know, I'm not a scholar, but, and then here's 14 hadith, two ayats, and, you know, 16 fatwas from eight different scholars. It, it's all, it's fake piety, right? They're really trying to show you that they know, but they don't want to say, you know, it's, I'm such a pious person, I don't want to let you know how much I, I know about Islam save it. Um, and the last one is applying broad or general hadith or ayat to a very specific situation. So a lot of people do this. You'll be talking about a very specific situation and they'll bring up a hadith that is very broad, right? Like it can mean and be applied in way, in so many different ways. Because they don't know a, a sul of fiqh. They don't know how the rulings work. So they just look at the little words and they say, yep, that's the one that fits for this instance. And it, it doesn't work that way. There are many different circumstances. There are a lot of details. That's why fatwas are, a lot of times are very specific. They're given to individuals. They're not just, uh, they're not just put out in general for the public, right? Someone asked a question and the fatwa they got was for that person because that person has a circumstance. And your circumstance may not be their circumstance. So you can't apply that fatwa to you because you're not under the same circumstances. That's what the importance of knowing people of knowledge so that you can ask them about your specific circumstance, not just in general. Um, so those are the red flags to look for. How to not be narrow-minded, right? I know about this ideology because I started with it. I started with it. New to Islam, you start learning, you start hanging out with certain groups of people, everything is black and white, I'm right, you are wrong. If you disagree with me in any way, then you, my brother, are misguided, and you're off the manhaj, or you're off the, you're, you're not on the haq, or even you're out of Islam. What it takes is one traveling outside of your community and talking to people with different uh, opinions, right? When you talk to people with different opinions, and you start looking at it from their perspective, you begin to realize that there are a lot of issues in Islam that are not clear cut. And everybody has their, their opinion about it. Everybody has their evidence for why they believe the way that they believe. And you can't just say, I'm, I'm right, and therefore anyone who doesn't agree with me is by fault misguided. That's their, their key word, misguided. Um, even the imams didn't agree on everything, right? There are some instances in which there was, you know, consensus amongst the, the imams and the scholars. But there are a lot of times, even when we talk about the four imams, 
three are in agreement, but there's still one who disagrees, right? And we typically take what the majority gives, but it just shows you that it's not as clear as you think. If it was so clear, if everything was so easy to determine just based on these hadith, then there would be no there would be no difference of opinion among scholars. They would all agree because it would all be very clear. But they don't. And then lastly is widening your research. So when people research topics, if I told you that you had to have a long beard, just for instance, if I said you had to have a long beard, I could go on YouTube and type why it's important to have a long beard. And I would find probably a hundred videos or more about why you should have a long beard. And I could put why it's haram to have a short beard and probably come up with more videos. And then I would then take those because there's so much of it and that's my evidence. And then I ship that off and give it to you as proof. But I wasn't really searching for the truth. I was searching for a list of people who already agreed with me. If I was searching for the truth, I would have searched something like, what does Islam say about the beard? What have the scholars said about the length of the beard? Where are the hadith related to the beard? You could come up with all different scenarios in which you get varying opinions to then compare. But if you only search for one thing, you're always going to have one idea. And you're never going to see the other side of the opinion. And it's a very dangerous place to be. So stay out of the comments. It's the, I don't think I've ever seen a comment in the comment section where someone read it and said, you know what, you're right. I have completely changed my mind. What you said was so, so brilliant. And the evidence, so clear that, you know, I have no choice but to, but to agree with you and change my opinion. It never happens. Because that's not the point of their comment. Their comment is not to engage you in any type of productive conversation. The point of their comment is to show how you're wrong. That's it. So if you want to spend your time going back and forth all day, and trust me, they have all day. That's what they do. That's their whole, that's what they do, like their job. They're not being productive. They're not giving dawah. They're not putting out good information. They're not uh, providing a service to the Muslims. No, they're refuting you. That's their job. That's their job. Their main job is to rid the world of your deviance and to clear up things because you're misguided and now you're misguiding all the people. So that's my goal for Ramadan is to completely avoid the comments and not just for Ramadan, forever. I'm done with it, right? There's no, I, I don't see not one benefit in responding to comments, not one. Never has it ever been a benefit. So find out what it is that you want to do with Ramadan. What is your goal? What are you going to improve? What are you going to stop doing or start doing? Pick one. Take a bad habit, get rid of it or take something that's a good habit and implement it. But don't just, you know, sleep and eat, right? That's not what it's about. And don't use COVID as an excuse because of the lockdown to not benefit from this time. This time is going to come and go, and then you'll never have the opportunity again. So inshallah, we've benefited, and uh, thanks for listening. We'll be finished here. Ramadan Kareem, Ramadan Mubarak. And I'm taking it easy, this Ramadan. So not a lot of media. If you're in Oman, uh, in Muscat, the station is 90.4, Oman's nation station. If you're in Sur, it is 95.5 FM, Oman's nation station. Um, I think I'll have to confirm the times. I believe it's from 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock. Either 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock or 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock. Um, me and Sheikh Hatem al Salam, we did a program, we pre-recorded 12 hours worth of it. So there will be 12 episodes um, every other day, I believe, for the month of Ramadan. If you have time, if you're traveling in your, in your car, have a listen, right? 
So get all the, getting all my stuff done beforehand so that I can really focus on the bigger picture. All right? Stop uh, wasting time putting things together. Start focusing on, sometimes you've got to focus on you. All right? Don't worry about everybody else. Focus on you. All right. Barakallahu feek. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.